Like most of Shakespeare's plays, he didn't invent the plot and characters of King Lear all by himself. In fact, King Lear was a historical king from ancient, pre-Christian Britain. Shakespeare would have been familiar with King Lear's history from the work of people like Raphael Holinshed and Geoffrey of Monmouth. The history, although fuzzy, loosely matches up with the story of the play. Of course, Shakespeare adds plenty of his own flair along the way. For example, he dramatised the historical story using the form of a tragedy, a type of play where the important character experiences a big downfall. Usually, a lot of people die at the end. This style of play goes way back to ancient Greece. The ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle identified the key conventions of tragedy. If you go through King Lear, you can see that the narratives of Lear and Gloucester follow these Aristotelian conventions very closely. First, the tragic hero has a serious hamartia, or fatal flaw. Lear has his selfishness and pride, and Gloucester is selfish and supremely gullible. This leads them down the path of self-destruction, and they suffer a turn of fortune called peripatia. Think about when Lear is kicked out of his daughter's houses and when Gloucester is blinded. The character's suffering evokes the audience's pity or pathos. Eventually, the tragic heroes recognise and accept their doom in a moment called anagnorisis. Ironically, Lear's anagnorisis occurs while he is mad, and Gloucester's happens when he is blind. The audience finally experiences an emotional release, or catharsis, in the hero's deaths. We can even see a bonus element of Greek tragedy in the character of the fool, the court clown, who acts as a kind of Greek chorus. In ancient Greece, the chorus was an actor or group of actors who would comment on and interpret the play's events, just as the fool does in King Lear. Now let's look at the historical and political situation when Shakespeare was writing. England had experienced a lot of political turmoil and civil war. In the 1500s, King Henry VIII decided to break from the Catholic Church and create his own Protestant branch of Christianity. As a result, violent conflict broke out between Catholicism and Protestantism. In King Lear, the theme of division is immediately evident as Lear literally divides the kingdom in the first scene. Shakespeare's audience, who had experienced lots of political and religious turmoil, would have known that this was a very bad decision. Peace and unity only came years later under Queen Elizabeth I. But as Queen Elizabeth grew older and remained unmarried, anxiety regarding succession abounded. She had no heirs. Would the peace continue? Luckily, Elizabeth named James VI, King of Scotland, as successor. King Lear was first performed in 1606, soon after Elizabeth died and James became king. Unlike King Lear, King James was a big fan of unity strongly advocating that England and Scotland should become unified. In the play, dividing the kingdom throws England into chaos. James would have liked the play because it showed the wisdom of his own political decisions centred on unity. In fact, King Lear opened on the day after Christmas. King Lear is a celebration of English peace and harmony and is a strong warning against division and chaos. Shakespeare and his audience believed in maintaining order according to the Great Chain of Being, a dominant religious ideology. The Great Chain of Being was a hierarchy that saw society organised with God reigning supreme at the top of the chain. He was followed by the king, who was chosen by God as his representative on earth. This was followed by the nobles and aristocrats, all the way down to the peasants, who were relatively powerless at the bottom of the chain. According to this worldview, God ordains where each person falls on the chain, and this order must be maintained, or else the world will fall into chaos. 
In King Lear, the king's loss of authority leads to absolute chaos in his family, in England, and even in the natural world. Relevant to the great chain of being was a concept called the divine right of kings. Since God ordained who was crowned king, attacking the king was considered rebellion against God himself. Fun fact. A year before the play was first performed, some conspirators blatantly disregarded the divine right of kings and were caught trying to blow up King James and his parliament. In King Lear, when the divine right of kings is violated, chaos ensues. This reminds the audience that rebelling against the king is a terrible sin. Another reason why King James would have loved the play. But Shakespeare's exploration of religion is more complex than black and white messages like don't disobey the king. True, the play is full of Christian theology and images. Think about Cordelia, whose characterization echoes Jesus. She offers forgiveness, is completely pure, and dies, even though she is innocent. However, despite these religious ideas, the play does not actually mention God or Christianity. Remember the historical King Lear? He lived in ancient, pagan England, before Christianity. So the play is full of ambiguity around whether a good God is in control of the world. Instead, the characters reference gods in the plural and fate more generally. Different characters have different views of the world. In medieval times, before Shakespeare, people were expected to accept a black and white religious worldview. But in Shakespeare's time, humanism was on the rise, a school of thought that valued human understanding and reasoning. So the contradictions in the play regarding religion reflect the complexities of real life. Shakespeare is inviting audiences to wrestle with the nature of justice for themselves, which was an important aspect of humanist thought. Gender was another important aspect of the great chain of being. Men were considered to be more powerful and had to maintain their authority over their families to keep order on a societal level. Women, on the other hand, were expected to be quiet and obedient and to submit to the man's place in the gender hierarchy. You may remember from your study of other plays that this understanding of gender is called patriarchy. When King Lear's characters upset the patriarchal order, Chaos ensues. Lear doesn't do a very good job as male head of household. He gives up his responsibility and authority in the first scene. This allows the women, Goneril and Regan, to gain more power. Studying Shakespeare in the 21st century, we are initially excited when Goneril and Regan seem to be empowered. But ultimately, Shakespeare reinforces the gender norms of his time. The women's grab for power is portrayed very negatively as it ultimately destroys the harmony of the whole kingdom. You can learn more about this in our video on gender. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on King Lear, check out our explanation of the play's plot summary.